Welcome to Sales Secrets from the Top 1%, where the world's best sales experts share their secrets to sales success. My name is Brandon Bornanson, a serial salesperson and entrepreneur, and I'm sitting down with the world's best sales experts to share their top secrets to sales success. I want to go into your background in sales. How'd you go from nothing to something to this world-renowned expert, you know, who wrote the seven stories, who's an engineer turned salesman that taught yourself storytelling on the job while managing sales teams and everything you've done in the UK, Russia, India, China, like your experience international is incredible. Seriously. Like it's, it's mind boggling. And I like, I've never had that international experience. Like I don't know how to sell to Russia and then China and then India. Like what? Like, I wouldn't even know where to start. How do you talk? How do you even communicate in outside sales, yeah. inside sales? What's the process? How do you map the accounts? Like, so I'm really intrigued by that. But and then the whole audience is dying to know, which she, obviously, you know, the premise of the book, like, you know, what is your top sales secret? You know, sure. what's your number? If you had to go back when you first started in sales, you're, you're 20 something, 18 something, 25 something. What is your secret, your number one secret to sales success? And we'll get to that here in a moment. But uh, first, humbled to have you. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's really great to be here, Brandon. Fabulous to talk. And I've, I've followed you on LinkedIn. And I noticed now you're a Snapchat guy as of, uh, what, yesterday, yeah? <laughs> yeah, so, so- Now I'm going to have to change. The Snapchat thing, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I'm all in on LinkedIn and I want to- I want to get to a million followers and fans and connections on LinkedIn. And then I'm going to really diversify. I was just using some of the filters on Snapchat to figure out like how to edit my video because I don't know what I'm doing, but uh, yeah, exactly. I'm slowly kind of figuring it out. I'm just a sales guy that doesn't know what I'm doing, but I'll, I'll do a lot and then learn along the way. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, let me answer your first question about yeah, how did I, how did I get into sales? How did where, I end up selling, selling from? all over the world? Yeah. You know, where are you from? What type of background family? Like, you know, we want to hear from the beginning and then go all the way to the present. That's sure. That'll be, that's one of the seven stories. That's my personal ah! story. So the, which, the, which I already knew about because I've, I've got the PDF. And yeah, everything. yeah. We, we tell our personal story in sales conversations so that we can get this personal story back of the other guy because we want to exchange stories, right? I grew up in Tasmania in a small island to the south of Australia okay. where we have, we have Tasmanian devils, but they don't spin round and round. I have to tell you. Not That's like amazing. Tas- and, Tas- uh, hold on. What, the Tasmanian devil. What? What is that type of creature? It's a, it's a marsupial, which means it, it, it carries its young in a pouch like okay. a kangaroo. Uh, okay. but, it's a, but it's a carnivore. It's, it's probably about the size of a house cat, but much fatter. And it has a sort of growling sound, which, which is why it was called a devil. But it's a carnivore it, it, and, and a scavenger. It, it mostly eats dead bodies in the, in the forest in, in wow. Tasmania. Yeah. So I I studied to be an engineer, Brandon. I came to sales quite late. Uh, I studied electrical and mechanical engineering and I got sort of a dream job. I I was hired by an oil and gas services company called Schlumberger. And and I went and lived all around the world working on oil rigs, running electronic surveys in oil wells. So I worked in China and I worked in China in the late eighties when everyone was riding a bicycle and wearing uh, military uniforms. Wow. uh, and then I worked in Malaysia and in were Indonesia. You scared? Like when you're going to all these different places and no, you're... look, I was in my early twenties. You don't, you're not scared when you're in your early twenties. You, you to... You're just ready to have fun. You Travel. don't get scared. You don't yeah. get scared until you have kids, Brandon. Oh, man, <laughs> I'm scared every day. So great, great. Now I got to deal with that too. And I don't have kids, so let, you know, I'm sure I'll deal with that sometime in the future. Yeah. So I was a, I was really a technical expert, and I. Uh, I, I stopped working on oil rigs and I went to London and I worked on some new software that my company was trying to sell into the oil and gas business. And I got this call into my manager's office one day and he said, Mike, we have this great career opportunity. We want you to go to Norway and sell software. And I was like, well, Norway, fantastic software. I don't want to sell software. And I actually said, look, I can't go because my wife is eight months pregnant with our second child. 
And uh, so he's like, okay. And then I went home and my wife said, no, I want to go to Norway. So, uh, and um, wow. so we flew, she, she flew on the last day that she could fly eight months pregnant. And uh, while yeah. she was in the delivery room in the public hospital, I was on a very early, this is 1996. I was on a very early mobile phone trying to be a salesperson, not, not a, although it's not being a very good new dad and not being a very good salesperson, I have to tell you. <laughs> And um, but what happened, Brandon, was I think I would not have stayed in sales. And I had a I had a get out of free card. Like I was told by my boss, look, if I didn't like it, I could go back and be an engineer. Uh, I was sort of more technical sales at that time. But I had this incredible good luck. And, and you know, I think in sales, it's good to acknowledge your good and bad fortune. But I, I sold the biggest deal in our company, in our division worldwide that first year and it was complete accident. I, I just happened to meet exactly the right time, this person in one of the major oil companies and, and he sold my deal for me globally. You know, I was sitting in Stavanger, Norway and, and he sold, he sold. Yeah. And it was just like, and it took me a while, Brandon, to realize how lucky I was. But because of that, I, I enjoyed it. You know, I thought I was good. Like a lot of salespeople, you know, we think we're good and we're probably on the average. Of course. And, <laughs> it happens to me every day. It happens to me every day, man. <laughs> because you know what? It's funny, you know, buyers have to buy and anyone can get in the way of a sale and think like my technique is good. And, and that was me, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, actually, I think it's the number one reason why a lot of salespeople don't try to improve their technique is they think, Hey, I'm pretty good. I sold some stuff, right? And wow. yes, yeah, you sold some stuff. So I went on, I was, I ended up living in Russia. I ran a sales team in Russia and opened up our business in Russia, working with a interpreter, but I learned to speak Russian too. Probably not that great, but I could, how I could understand. How did it take you to learn how to speak uh, Russian? I, I, I had, look, when I lived in Norway, everyone spoke English. And I okay. didn't try, didn't try to speak Norwegian, only a few words. And, and when I left Norway, I felt bad that I couldn't say goodbye in their language. And so when I went to Russia, I was determined to learn the language. And I actually started learning before I went. I knew about two months before I was going, I was in Australia at the time. And so I started language lessons and I put a huge effort into it. And I'm so glad I did because you really get to know a country a lot better when you can speak the language. And I never got to the point where I was comfortable to be without an interpreter in an important business meeting to just be on my own. Right. But I was good enough socially to go out with clients and, and we would chat and we could talk about family and all that stuff. And, and so, yeah, you just put a big effort into it and it's worth it. And then it was wow, time to come. Incredible. Oh, and by the way, yeah. we no, we didn't touch on why did your wife want to go to Norway? Because you said you had she's a, well, she's, uh, she is as adventurous as I am. She actually spent a year in uh, Thailand when she was fifteen on a on an exchange. Wow. So she'd already done a lot of traveling and um, I always dreamed of doing something like that, and I never ended up going through with it. Like in college, yeah. you know, have those opportunities. It's ah. Well, she was she she um at age 15 she did that and she land, she lived in a village where no one spoke a word of english so she had to learn thai real fast wow and yeah so yeah so then we came back to live in australia and uh, and the reason was my dad got sick so i'd spent quite a long time with schlumberger and, and i was going really well but um it was really time to come home and we decided to live in Melbourne. We didn't have any friends in Melbourne. My, my, just had my sister, but I'd never worked here. I heard it's beautiful there. Oh, it's, it's the easiest place in the world to live. By the way, it's can you believe this? I was just at a wedding and my fiance's best friend married a famous Australian rugby player. Really? I gotta, okay. I got to look up his name, but because ah. it's, it seems like you guys love rugby i used to play well rugby. We, we we have two types of rugby here and okay. uh, we're doing pretty we do pretty well in one of them but we're not doing so well in the other at the moment. Uh. <laughs> okay this by, by the way what you just did there is what happens when you tell your personal story now i'm i'm telling a kind of a longer version in a business meeting i'll only tell this in a couple of minutes but um but you just picked up on something you know i'm in melbourne you know someone in australia that's when we put out a personal story people just pick little things and go oh that's incredible my sister was in russia or whatever you know so this is one of the things that connects you 
I was uh, just about to say, is that person. good or bad? Because I'm still good. new to this, so I don't want to. Really, it's it's good. Okay. Uh, and awesome. Yeah. I'll, when I come to the, I'll just I'll just briefly wrap up. So I, I I had to change industry, Brandon, and and that's when you went to Russia. No, this is from Russia. When I came back okay. to Australia, there's no oil and gas business in in Melbourne. There is in Perth in Western Australia, but not really in Melbourne. So so I ended up changing to work in telecommunications, selling. Uh, telecoms network equipment to, to telecommunications carriers and, and big ticket items in the sort of ten hundred million dollar size deals and and I didn't wow. know anything I, I didn't know my client I didn't know the industry I didn't know my company actually I, I was working for Siemens that was the hardest thing to learn was this German company and and so I but I I told a good story to get the job and I had already figured out a little bit about storytelling by then and I knew that I needed certain stories to learn a new industry because see, when you start in a, you start fresh in an industry, you don't even know the language. You don't even know that you're saying the wrong thing, right? You, you, you don't know the, the jargon. Right. And you, you think like, that's what I have to learn. Well, I'm an engineer, so I can kind of learn the technical jargon fairly quickly, but, but what you really need to know is who is this company I'm working with and why are they important and who is my client really? And what are we selling and how do I position what we're selling? And these things are best learnt by stories. And, and there, are, there are three stories there. One is the company story. And every salesperson should be able to tell their company story. And I, I, how long is your podcast going to go for, Brandon, when it, when it comes we, out? So of, typically we've got, we've got anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes. Right. I'll, I, don't, I'll, I don't put any hard stop because... Our goal is to, to maximize the wealth, health, and potential of our audience. Good. To, to share your background, to share your story so that we can learn from it. Like I've never sure. done, me and my, you know, I've never done international sales. Um, I did one to $10 million deals, but I haven't done 10 to $100 million deals. Like I've done a lot in volume, over yes. $100 million, but not like 10 to $100 million. Well, there's the- so, yeah, there's not really of, the the we big difference is to appeal with you, man. We do, yeah. Really large deals just take longer, and they involve a whole lot more people. I mean, that's but the basic difference. They become more like project management than sale, selling. But anyway, I'll tell you that I'll tell your listeners. I'm sort of working through my company story, but before I get on to how I ended up consulting and storytelling, I'll give your listeners an example of a company story because every salesperson should be able to tell their company story as a narrative. Why does your company exist? How did your company get to exist? And this is probably the first time I really noticed that stories do work. And this was when I was in Russia. So Schlumberger, the company I was working with is, is a very famous company in the oil and gas industry, but your listeners may not have heard of it. So they started in, yeah, the, I'm new to in that. <clears throat> yeah, they started in the late 1920s, two French brothers, engineers and physicists, they invented a technique. They lowered a, an electrode in an oil well, and they measured the resistivity between the electrode and the surface. And then you move the electrode up the well, and you get a changing resistivity. And it turns out that oil has a high resistivity, and water, which is what's normally in an oil in a well, has a low resistivity. So they invented an indicator for oil. They could tell the oil company, here is where the oil is. It's at exactly that depth. Oh, wow. And, wait, wait, what <coughs> yeah. depth of accuracy? Pretty accurate because you run that sensor on a cable and it's probably accurate to a meter or so. And the, and the oil well might be a few thousand meters deep. So that simple invention created a $30 billion industry. They're a massive company. And, but when they first started, and this is the typical problem of the entrepreneur, right? No one was interested, right? So how do you get started? And it turned out the place in the world that, they, that, that figured out this was an important invention was the Soviet Union. So their first client was, was Russia and the Soviet Union. And they, they took uh, trucks with all this equipment all over the, the former Soviet Union in the 1930s. But they had a bit of bad luck. They got nationalized by Stalin. So uh, they, they had all their equipment stolen. as actually a no. darkest, darker story by this. They're kicked out of the country. And Everything so fast. Stolen, I bet you, how much do you think they lost from that? Oh, they would have lost. Tens of millions, the, mo of yeah, millions. most of the capital value of their com company. But fortunately, they'd already started work in the US by then. They were already working in Texas. So they didn't lose the whole company. But um, 
So if you fast forward to the late 1980s when Russia is, is opening up for Western companies again, Schlumberger had to make a decision. Do we go back into Russia or not, right? And the, the strategy guys took a business case to the CEO and they, and they asked him a simple question, which was, how much money are you prepared to lose going back into Russia? Yep. And he said, without thinking, he said $200 million. And they, they said, okay, we're going to work with two of the Russian oil companies. They're newly privatized. We'll put in CFO, chief production officer. We'll put all the tech in and we'll see if we can make it work. And they doubled the production for those two companies in 18 months. And the whole Russian oil company was going down and these two companies went boom. And so I heard, this, I heard the elements of that story, Brandon, which is a fantastic story. Yeah, and I just started, just started telling it to my clients. And this is how you know what stories do, because I would go to meet another client and they would tell me my story back. So that, like, I'd, I'd get the story, oh, shit, you're back in Russia and you were kicked out. And I'm going, oh, this story is doing work, right? Because what's inside that story? In, most salespeople want to say, like, we're the number one company in our business, and Schlumberger is. And they want to say, and we're, we're in uh, every country in the world, and Schlumberger is. But I didn't say any of those things. I think I, I said, got a hundred of those messages today. Correct. You, you get know, those on LinkedIn, get those email. I, I got like 50, literally, I, I, I got, I think, 50 calls just like yeah. that probably. We like, are ex- we are ex- insane. Yeah. yeah. It's just insane. So they're giving you facts, right? But humans don't want facts. We want the story. And the story has all the facts in it. The story tells you this is Schlumberger. This is what they do. This is how they started. This is how they nearly failed. Here's how they succeeded. And this is what company. And by the way, they'll make you rich. They doubled these other guys' business in 18 months, right? Wow. So it's beautiful. The story is fantastic, right? So this is, back in, this is back in the year 2000 was when I started to go, holy shit, you know, stories. This story is doing work. Stories do work on their own. I wasn't even there. And these Wait, guys are telling the story, right? You know, so how, did just- you, how long did it take you to realize that you should tell stories in sales versus selling facts? Like, was that, where were you? In probably your another, ten, another 10 years, probably. I'm a slow learner, right? You know, <laughs> as an engineer, it took you 10 years to figure that out. Yeah, because it's, in, you know, because stories are, stories are invisible. We don't. You know, except for that exceptional situation where we go, man, I, yeah, that story. So we're not that, we're not that, cle- that's why I wrote the book because people don't really realize the difference between tell it as a narrative versus trying to f- push facts and opinions, right? Yeah. The opposite to story is fact. So we say this fact, this fact, my opinion and all that happens is your client doesn't listen because all your competitors say the same facts. Those facts all sound the same, but none of your competitors have that story. That story is unique. So, wow. That's interesting. Incredible. Isn't it? That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I, remember, I remember the exact day where I started using that approach. Um, I was selling for IBM Interactive. Yeah. And it was all about facts. This is who IBM is. These are the clients. These are the awards. This is what we do. This is who we help. This is how great we are. And I just got so sick. That was like five to 10 slides just in the intro demo. Five let me tell you, let me tell you all about me, right? Oh let me my tell you all about gosh. <laughs> I, I was the boy. I, I think like your, your, your seven stories and, and how you talk about how important storytelling is something most of us have to do easily in private conversations in the business. Like, you know, I, I know I read through your book and you talk about business storytelling needs to be, uh, you know, you need to tell well, those it stories. Make, it needs to make a point. That's the only difference, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's yeah. incredible. And yeah. um, when it comes to, so, okay. So you realized it 10 years later that you need to tell stories. Yeah. What actually happened to me, Brandon was uh, I changed industry from oil and gas to telecommunications and the company I worked for did a massive merger. So the Nokia, Nokia and Siemens merged their network business. And this is like 60,000 people who don't have a job that need to figure out what their new job is, right? And a lot of people lost their jobs, actually. But, a lot of people. I, but I got sent overseas again. I went to Kuala Lumpur and I ran a big sales team. I had 140 sales guys. When I started, I only had 80 when I finished because I had to like wow. rationalize this down. But the, 
but and I enjoyed that. I enjoyed working in that sales force. Yeah, all over over Asia, and uh, now and now, did you speak? Uh, the language when you were there with this 180 well, salesperson team? This is not as tricky as Russia because the business language is much more English, like in India and Vietnam and, and even China now, you can do business pretty well in English. So this is now, now we've come forward to the mid 2000s. And so, so, so I, I didn't, tr- and because my role was a regional role, so I was going from country to country and helping with the biggest opportunities. So I was kind of like the guy you wheel in to try and help you close your biggest deal. And, um, and that was, that's really interesting because what happens when you do that is you get a really good perspective on the skill level of your sales guys because they do the introduction, you know, and then they introduce you in and they tell you about the opportunity and this is where you start to see some of the very common problems that salespeople have. And, and, I, and I had also managed sales teams in, in Schlumberger as well. And, and the, the typical issue that salespeople have, and we all do this, like you and me, we still do this. Uh, it's not like I want to pretend I'm the fabulous guy, but, but we want to talk about our product and service too early. We don't connect first, you know. I was going to say, like, you've seen all those books behind me. Most of them are sales books and, and yes. 90% of I them. Love that, by the way, it looks so yeah, awesome. That backdrop. Yeah. There's seven stories there. Yeah. 90%, 90% of those books are about one of two things. They're either about questioning skills or they're about motivation. So the motivation books are, you know, grit, determination, get out there. And we need a bit of that, right? The questioning skills are really important, but there's a missing element. If I ask you an in-depth question, Brandon, you are not likely to give me a very open answer if you don't know who I am and you don't really trust me. Yep. And salespeople, when they turn up, I have to tell your listeners that when you turn up for your first meeting, I'm sorry, guys, but you are not trusted. Uh, unless you got the world's best referral. And even then, you're not really that trusted. You're a sales guy. And you ask your fancy duper questions from your questioning book and you don't get very good answers because you missed a step. And that step is I got to get, I got to get trusted first. And that's what these stories, the hook stories, the first three stories are doing. I'm telling you my personal story and your listeners are starting to get to understand who Mike is. Right. And he maybe knows something, right? Maybe. So, so the objective of the connection stories, which is your company story, your personal story, and your key staff story, which we'll get onto in a sec, that's the story about someone else in your company that your client needs to know about. And when you tell that story, they start to trust them before they even meet them. It's really important for a couple of reasons I'll get onto. But if you don't do this little story exchange in your first face-to-face meeting, you run the risk of not getting the full picture. You, you try to go into expiration too early and they don't trust you. So they don't really tell you the full picture. So you didn't really find out what's going on. And so you, you bomb. It's that simple, right? And Mike Bosworth, who wrote the forward for seven stories, fantastic guy. He, he's the author of solution selling. Yep. He's, he calls it premature elaboration. I, I, I love that. I love that phrase, right? We, we talk about ourselves and our products too soon. Wow. And now we'll talk a little bit in a minute about the, the SDR and, and the call, the reach yeah. out, because we can't tell a personal story in that situation. So we've got to back up a little bit in a minute. But And but I totally get the, with the personal story, not, sorry, I don't want to interrupt, but I know no, you've, go got, so you've got the seven stories, right? You've got the personal yes. story, and then we're going to go into the key staff story, the company creation story, the insight yes. stories, the success stories, the values and the teaching. So yes. the personal story are you trying to tell stories about you and your struggles and then why you joined this company? Are you trying to tell the company's stories? Like, you know, give me some examples of some personal stories. And I know you told one earlier, so I just want the viewer to understand. I've I've told you, I've told you a a much too long version of my personal story and I've only got halfway through it so far. So I couldn't do that in a business meeting, but what I could do is I could say, look, um, let's say I'm meeting you, Brandon, and I'm a, I'm a consultant and I'm going to help you with, help you with the sales team, right? So that's what I do these days. Yep. So why should Brandon trust Mike that? 
Well, I might say, well, Brandon, look, I haven't always been a sales consultant. I started as actually as an engineer and I didn't even want to be a sales person even, let alone a yeah. sales consultant, right? But I was in Norway, I was in London and, and I got offered that job. And I might tell briefly about going to Norway and then I would say, look, and I ended up changing industry three or four times, mostly by accident. And I had to figure out how to sell quickly. And I had noticed that storytelling is one of the things that got me going. And I actually changed business career five times. And the most recent one was to become sales consultant. And now I help companies like yours find stories. Now I told that in like 30 seconds, I wouldn't tell it that quickly. I'd take about two minutes. And then I would say, but Brandon, before we talk about your company, what about you? How did you get to become head of a company like Seamless AI, you know? And then I'd, you wouldn't tell me your story probably quite as tight, but if I put something personal in, if I put in, look, my wife was eight months pregnant when we went to Norway, you'd probably tell me, well, I don't have kids yet, right? That I've done this and that, or I've got a girlfriend and, you know, so I'm seeding a few things into my story, which is, who am I? Why do I do what I do? Why am I a sales consultant? Why am I in front of you? And if I put something a little bit personal in, you put it, you tell me something personal back. Wow. And now in about seven or eight minutes, we will have exchanged stories. And that's the key. Wow. That, You're planting these see these like correct. psychological seeds in advance that absolutely because this connection, this story connection. And you did it with the uh, with the wife. Eight months, yes. right? I didn't even notice you were doing it on me. That's it. And so I, I was immediately <laughs> talking about my fiance and how I don't have kids. You're like, that's the scariest thing you'll ever have to do. Um, wow. So, so it's like you're leveraging storytelling and then making it relatable. Yeah, okay, excellent. So keep going. So you're yeah, dropping so these psychological correct oh, story uh, look uh, uh, all i'm doing is tell you what telling you what happened but here's the interesting thing brandon every human has an interesting story they just love do. We, we, we love to know about other humans and if you th if you look about you know rapport is the how do two humans get rapport this is the least understood thing in sales or in business i would say um, you know, they used to say, notice something on the client's desk and talk about a photo or something like that. Everyone knows that's corny, right? Yeah. Um, and, but so what salespeople tend to do is they tend to like jump in early. But if you do this step, if you tell a story that explains why you do what you do, and I'm sure I'm interested to know why you do what you do, Brandon, why? Because you've had a career as a sales guy, right? And what, what got you to this company and why that problem that you're solving, I'll bet you there's a story behind that, right? Yeah. And I know, um, I, I tell it pretty loudly, right? Like, which I'm sure you see on social media and LinkedIn and everything. But, uh, so tell me, is that like, is that a story within a story? Are you like reverse storying me again with these? No, psychological I'm, seeds? no, I'm just making the point, the really important point that if, if people, if your listeners get the idea that I just need to tell my personal story, they've missed 50%. You're telling your personal story so you can say, Hey, Brandon, what about you? How, why did you start a company called seamless AI? It's sharing the story is sharing stories is how we get the rapport not just yeah. telling the story, right? That's the important point. Yeah, so, so, so basically like sharing your story, but then also being curious and caring to hear what the other person's story is. And then that allows you to bridge the gap and relate or not relate at all, but still learn from each other because you have valuable experiences that you could both learn from. I've never had a situation where this doesn't relate, Brandon. I've never, never, ever had a situation where we do that story exchange and we don't find common ground. Yeah. That, I always. mean, there's always incredible. Ground. Yeah. And, and like, for example, I don't know anything about international selling. I've never even traveled internationally. I'm not an engineer. I haven't. We still, we still found common ground. And yeah, that's what I'm saying. And I, I haven't <laughs> managed hundreds of salespeople like you and yeah. we still found common ground. Exactly. So that's, that's a really important point. So, and if you only get that from the book, I'm happy, right? Because that's like, 
this is like 90% of the problem, right? You, you got, you got this client, you know, you've got a product, you know that, that they need it and you can't connect. Like that's it. There's no closing the deal, right? You're never getting there because you can't connect. They don't trust you. You sound like all the other sales guys. So you I'm sound not like a fact reader, like you said. Correct, right? correct. Reading those facts about the company and about the case studies and about the yeah. value propositions and benefits yeah. without connecting, storytelling, relating. Wow. Yeah. So let me briefly talk about the key staff story. It's yeah. like Tell me about you're going to. So the second this is story the, is the key staff story. Right? That's right. So you're going to talk about another person in your company that your future client, the person you're talking with needs to know about. It might be your CEO. If you're a startup company, it might be your technical sales guy that hasn't got to the meeting yet. It might be your head of customer service or the project implementation leader, but there's a very, and you may not do this in the first meeting, Brandon, it just depends. But if you're on a, on a big deal, on a reasonable sized deal, there's going to be more than just you, the sales guy, and you need your future client to trust those other people. And this is, this is a story that most salespeople don't collect. So you have to collect it purposely. You need to go and find out about your coworker. So you want to know their backstory and it's different from the personal story. In my personal story, I told you I was lucky, which is true. And I didn't say I was the world's greatest sales guy. I did say that I worked on big deals, but look, I lost a whole lot as well. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to make myself out as, as a superhuman. I'm trying to actually show vulnerability. But when I tell the key staff story, for sure, I can say that's the most brilliant guy you're ever going to meet. That's okay. I can, I can pump them up. But most salespeople don't do this. And there's a very common problem that, that salespeople have, maybe not so much SDRs, but a lot of salespeople get caught up in the implementation. So instead of doing their proper job, which is going out and selling the next deal, they're stuck as the main connection. So they've actually done a good job building rapport with their client and they can't break away. And the reason they can't break away is they haven't told this key staff story. They haven't pumped up the other people in their organization. So their client is confident, confident and comfortable to interact with them and say, okay, I don't need to work with Mike anymore. Thanks for the introduction. I, I now trust these other guys. So you haven't, you haven't set up the rest of your organization to be trusted. That's really important. And, it's, and you won't be able to do that if you don't sit down with your CEO or whoever it is, whoever you decide is, it is, and learn their story, which means exchanging stories. Wow. And so that means you not only have to master how you're going to tell your personal story, you have to master how you're going to tell your team's story. Yep. And your company story. So we're already up to three stories and it takes a little bit of effort, Brandon, but this effort pays off big time. It really pays off. And, and I feel like you could almost do just for the sales development community. And again, because I'm new to these concepts as well, you know, from Mike Adams, like I feel like you could do almost a slide. Like I think of everything like as a process in PowerPoint yes. for some reason, like boom, one slide is the personal story who am I and, and where, why am I here? And then boom, here's yeah. like the CEO and why he's here and why he's building this company. And then kind of the company story, which is number three, yeah. right? The company creation. Yeah. It's so number three, yeah. company creation number three. And those three stories together, and you might tell a little combination. So some people would tell, like, let's say if you're the founder of a company, then your company story is your personal story. Right. Right. But, and if you're working for a big corporation, you might tell, a little bit about your personal background and then you might say how you joined that company and what they do and tell a little combo of the company story and your personal story. So there are different ways to mix these stories. Brandon, I think it's important that I just define exactly what a story is because there's confusion. You know, a, a decade ago, you couldn't even use the word story because people thought that's for children. Now everyone says story, but half the time they say story and they're not really telling a story. So here's the definition. Number one, a story is a sequence of related events. Wow. It's a sequence of related events. So when I go on your website and it says our company started in 1985, that's an event. Good. 
let's say it's, we started in Portland in 1985. Good, that's an event. It's got a time and a place, tick. We're the biggest company in the United States that does this. That's not a related event. That's a fact. It's suddenly now not a story. So if you're not telling a sequence of related events, it's not a story. Really important. Here's the second thing. Wow. It has to have an unpredictable, surprising twist, or it's a boring story. And there's a reason for this, Brandon. The biggest part of your brain, if you hold two fists in front of you, it's about that big, and it's in two halves, and it's wrinkly, exactly like that. That's called the neocortex. It's actually, a, it's actually if you unfold it, it's a great big sheet of tissue that's only like two millimeters thick with wow. billions of nerve connections to it. And it's doing one thing. So most people can't tell you what 80% of your brain does. And here's what it's doing. It is memorizing sequences in your environment that repeat. And it's predicting what's going to happen next. Your brain was predicting the word next. Yep. And, <laughs> so that, so what, that's what science, dude. I, I, like, I'm getting that's the science right now. Yeah. Right. So that's the science. So you have this organ. All okay. it does is collects all the information from your sight, your hearing, your balance, and very importantly, Brandon, your internal body. We call this interoception. Your, bo- your brain is sensing your guts, your heart rate, your feeling, how comfortable you're feeling, yep. all your sense of arousal. It's sensing all of that. And it doesn't care whether it's, whether it's got an input that's vision or sound or your body or whatever. All it's doing is it's trying to find patterns that repeat and it goes okay i've heard that pattern before the next thing is this and and you can you can notice that this is what your brain is doing in some funny situations the one i like to tell people is is going up to an escalator so i don't know if you're aware but when you go up to an escalator your brain is predicting a lot of things it's predicting how your body should move and it's predicting how you should go on to the escalator and you know what it feels like when the escalator happens to be stopped and you go onto the thing and you suddenly do this funny lurch forward and you almost yep. fall over. And I it's do the that most at the airport ridiculous. like all the time, you know? Yeah, like, it's, the most, it's the most incredible feeling, right? Because your brain was happily predicting, here's this memory prediction organ and it's predicting what you're going to see and it's predicting this, the vision of the escalator, it's predicting your balance and it's predicting how your legs have to move and suddenly your prediction is wrong. And now you're falling and you are paying attention, right? You are absolutely, you might've been on your phone or whatever. Now you're paying attention because you're trying not to fall over. And that is an excellent definition of a good story because good stories are unpredictable. They're like that falling over on the escalator. You have to pay attention because you know that stories are unpredictable and you wanna know what's gonna happen next. Because stories are a sequence and you want to know what's going to happen next and you don't know what's going to happen. So you pay attention. And the reason that people listen to stories and remember what happens in the story and forget all the facts is because we pay attention. And this is critically important because I would say in 2018, the difference between 2018 and 2013 is that people are more distracted than they were five years ago because we've got this blooming smartphone that yeah. can tell us anything we need to know at an instant. And the instant something is predictable and we think we can predict what's going to happen, we jump on our phone to find something more interesting, right? So if you're not telling stories, you're losing attention fast, right? Wow, it's all about uh, fast, attention. Huh? Fast. It's all about getting attention, right? Okay, there's, so I talked about we need a time and a place because the time and the place sets the first event and it starts the story. So people get stories wrong by not starting them right. So when I say, look, in 1996, I went to Norway, you know a true story is starting. If I say once upon a time, you know a fairy tale is starting. If I don't say in 1996 when I was in Norway, you may be not sure that a story is going to start and you may not pay attention. Wow. So that's important. So it's got to be a sequence of events. It's got to be unpredictable. And here's the final thing. It has to make a relevant business point. 
Otherwise, you're wasting people's time. So one, one reason that CEOs and CFOs might say, I don't want to hear a story, is they've had their time wasted, right? People have come in and told a frivolous story. So we're trying to win business. This is serious. And we've got someone's meeting time or we've interrupted them even worse. And we cannot waste their time. We just cannot waste their time. So we have to put into the story important things that they need to know. So if you do those things, if you start with a time and a place so that people know a story is coming, if you always make sure it's a sequence of events, if you refine your story so they are unpredictable and therefore interesting and you make a business point, you can start to master business storytelling and you can probably see, look, this takes a bit of practice, right? Yeah. And, and I love the, cause when you said the 1966, right? No, well, only five years ago, if you go back to 2013, Oh, 1996 was 19, when I went to like the when you yes. said that I'm, I'm in my head taking myself back and then I'm trying to envision what Norway looks like because I've never been yeah. there. I've seen it on TV. Correct. Feel it's just beautiful. The visual, and I see it back then, and I'm like, okay. Man, my office, like? my office looked down the Lisa Fjord, which is 2,000 meters of vertical cliff. I mean, it's just the most stunning. And that isn't even the best office I've had, Brandon. I, I was on the 75th floor of the Twin Towers in Kuala Lumpur, you know. But, you know, wow. so, yeah. So, and all those things help you visualize. <laughs> correct. correct. It, the, uh, like the neocortex, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but I feel it like does. I'm just starting to visualize all this and it's stimulating it the brain. Yes. So what happens is we never get the full story, but our neocortex, our brain fills in the gaps for us. You know, it's exactly what you said. Oh, Norway, it does. Okay, that's in Norway. I wonder what Mike's going to say next. Oh, this, that. And you're just following along, right? Wow. So let's move into, company we've creation. hooked our fish. No, I, I told you the Schlumberger company story. Yep, you're right. Um, so, so let's move on to the next two stories, stories four and five. And these ones are, these are the key two stories for salespeople. The first one is called the insight story. And the second one is called the success story. If you're an entrepreneur, and I think you are, when you start business, you do not have a successful client. And that is the toughest place in the world to be as a salesperson, because you can't go and point to some of the client and say, look what happened to them. All you have actually is insight. You have some idea. You have an idea that you're, you think that your market or your client needs. In fact, you're pretty convinced. But that's all you have. You've got an idea. So right. how do you... But the problem is this, Brandon. Your client thinks they know how to run their business. They're pretty confident they know what they're doing. They, don't necessarily, the they don't necessarily the think you have, a, you have a good idea. So how do you come in and go, wait, man, you're doing it all wrong. You need this new thing. And they go, a thousand people a day tell me I'm doing it all wrong. And I think I'm going okay, right? So it doesn't work. So you need an insight story. And I I'll tell you. I love that. So That's entrepreneurs really have to have an insight story. So I'll tell you an example. This is my favorite insight story. It's in the book. Um, so th this story dates back to 1982. So there are two Perth-based researchers, uh, Barry Marshall and Robin Warren. And they're working on the problem of stomach ulcers and they had a hypothesis. They thought that stomach ulcers were caused by a particular bacteria. They wrote a paper on that. It was rejected because the medical community thought that stomach ulcers were caused by stress. That was the prevailing view. I remember and, hearing about the, all this stuff back in yeah, the Yeah, and it was study. thought that um, bacteria can't survive in the acidic environment of the stomach. So it's impossible. So they're in frustration. They've got this wonderful insight that's very valuable, but um, they can't get their idea across. And that's a typical entrepreneur's problem. And so in frustration, Barry Marshall gave himself an, an endoscopy of his own stomach to show that he was healthy. Got an infected patient, uh, made a potion of stomach ulcer back to, of, from a stomach of an infected patient, drank it himself, gave himself stomach ulcers, treated himself with the antibacteria and wrote the paper about that. Well, you can imagine, you can imagine the fuss that got, right? 
Wow. But Marshall, Marshall and Warren won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2004 for, that, for the discovery of the cure for stomach ulcers. Wow, that's insane. What? Insane. However, it what? is also a beautiful insight story. So let's, let's unpack it. So no one believed, so no one, we got to dive into this. Like no quick. one believed no him. No one believed him. And then he, no one believed. he took the, the sick patient. Yep. D made up a potion drank of, drank it, gave himself <laughs> stomach ulcers and then this treated is, himself. Was he like a hundred percent confident he could for sure? <laughs> like what, this Probably. guy's crazy. Probably not, right? But he felt the problem was so important. Look, he's your typical entrepreneur. He wants to get his idea out there. He knows it's a brilliant idea, right? But shit, no one's listening. That's like saying like, yeah, I think I can fly. I'm going to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge and fly, man. That's crazy, but it works. Yeah. Well, if you're, selling, if you're selling the first airplane, you might have to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge with your airplane, right? Yeah. And so let's unpack wow. it. The insight story is the discovery story. How did you get to that discovery and how did you prove it? It's the researcher's story. So you got to go back to, and you got to teach your client this insight. So there, you might've heard of the challenger books and the challenger sale. And we're taught yeah, like we have to Dixon. go and challenge our client. Matt Dixon, right? Yeah. Matt, Matt Dixon and Brent uh, Abrahamson. And that is a fabulous book because it teaches you how to find insight, but it doesn't really teach you how to deliver the insight. In fact, the conversations in that book are not quite real sales conversations because those guys are not really salespeople. You can kind of tell. Um, but so what you need is uh, this is and, and research R and D departments make this mistake all the time. They do the R and D, they find the fantastic insight. And what do they do? They send the sales team a hundred PowerPoint slides, right? With every blooming detail and graph, but wow. they don't tell, the they don't tell you how the hell did you find this thing out? That's the story I've got to tell, right? I've got to, because that's where your client is at the beginning. Your client doesn't know that thing. So let's take them on the journey from not knowing that thing to this is how we figured it out. This is how we nearly failed. Here's how Barry Marshall nearly died doing that thing. And here is the eureka moment where we found it. If you do that, they go along for the journey. They, they listen, they pay attention, yep. Yep. and they get it, right? So the most important thing for an entrepreneur is to be able to tell the story of how they got their insight. And then, and then it goes. Not understood well at all, Brandon. It really not understood well at all. Wow. So that story. So yeah. yeah. The insights. So let's, let's just use some. And then does the insights fuel the next story of success? Like, so if I find out that let's just say, 83% of salespeople miss their quote every year. And then I, that in, I talk about that insight because it, it, well, that, that, that's a fact actually, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a fact. Um, so you could tell the story about how the research was done to find that out, which would be pretty interesting. And I would actually like to know which companies provided that data. How did you set up an experiment to get that number, right? And you could say, man, we couldn't believe that 83% miss their number, right? I, I can believe that. I've been a sales leader. So, but you tell the story how you got the fact, but I think your insight is something different. Your insight is what they miss, what they don't have to be able to make their number. Right. So how did you find, how did you find that out? You can mention the fact and then you go into the insights, like, and what we Correct. realized was the data out there is killing companies because salespeople don't have the sales leads and, and that's the insight. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Fast, fast. And you might, you could even pull that into a single story of a single person. You know, it wasn't until we watched this one guy and I couldn't believe he wasted seven hours out of an eight hour day doing this, you know, and like Barry Marshall is just one guy. He's not, yep. we actually drown our clients in all of this data but one data point is more compelling, actually. One data point can be more compelling than all the data in the world if we pick the right data point, it, because that's a story. We can make a story out of one data point. It's really interesting. Wow, that, that's incredible. Yeah, I, uh, 
it's funny that the challenger sale and the insights stories yes when i you know just to relate again like I me mean, personally when i was selling for ibm and google that's that's how you sold like you had to use insights and research and strategy of everything that you yeah, analyzed but the, about. But they never, they never figured out the actual story that made it interesting that you had to do yeah. that yourself. Right. Yep. You got to bring it all together. Yeah. Yeah. And wow. so, you know, companies it, spend it, it success, right? Like, so the insights, you talk about these insights that you've identified and learned and recommend, I guess. And then from these insights, this is, is it like a before and after kind of like before and then here's the generally generally with i call it another name for the insight story would be the researcher's story i told you barry marshall's story the hero of that story was barry marshall so who in your company it might be yourself sometimes it's yourself maybe you yep. discovered this thing but tell me how you discovered that insight Okay. Tell me the story of it. Don't tell me the facts at the end. We, we, like to, we just like to give the answer when we're a research department. Here's the answer, and here's 100 pie charts and graphs and everything that show you the answer. Good. How did you get that answer? Tell me that story. That's the critical thing that's okay. missing from this, right? That's what we yeah. don't do. Yes. Huh. Because if you think about it, your client needs to know how you got there. They don't believe your facts but they will listen to and believe your story about how you got to the facts. Yeah. Critical difference. Critical difference. Wow. That's incredible. So let's talk about success yeah. stories because yeah. if you, if most companies are in, been in business and certainly most sales teams, if you're in a sales team, your company by definition has had success because entrepreneurs don't have a sales team. Usually okay. they've got themselves and their founder and maybe a tech guy. Right. So, so, but as soon as you have successful clients, it suddenly becomes possible to have a sales team because my definition of a sales person, I actually, I actually have three types of salespeople. I call them magicians, Marines, and medics. A magician is a person who can, oh my gosh, who can open, open on, a new business. Magicians, Marines, Marines and, medics. and medics. Yes. So the these are... M's? Yeah, three M's. I wrote, a, I wrote a blog article on this a while back. So magicians are true new business developers. developers. And my definition of a magician is they don't have a success story. They've got to go and open a new market and there's no successful client. Uh, that, that's hardest, how I felt when I launched my company. Hardest job in sales. Hardest job in sales bar nothing. It's very difficult. They have to have an insight story. They need an insight story. Once you've got successful clients, you can start hiring Marines. Marines have to be told how to sell. They have to be told, this is the process. You take this, you do this, you tell that, you show that, you do a presentation, bang, bang, bang. And they do it. They follow the process and they do it month in, month out. And they're determined and they're persistent and they're a different personality from magicians completely. Magicians are curious. They're not very good. They're not that disciplined usually. They're kind of interested in the next difficult thing to do. They start multiple companies. They churn things around. They're creative, but they're not typically that disciplined. They're a different personality from the person that will sell the same thing month in, month out and hit target. So Marines are different and you need both, right? If you're going to grow your company, you need Marines, but you need the magician to start. Wow. And then you have medics. I love that. I love how you the, explain the Marines. Like, yeah. So I, Marine, it's almost like a factory or I'm seeing it like yes. where you're training them to do the same yeah. thing, the same way every time so that they get trained and they know how to go into battle. Correct. And their uh, ammunition, their weaponry is success stories. The best thing you can do for Marines is give them the relevant success story. You're going to go and you're going to go and meet a pharmaceutical company in the West coast Here's a, another client and here's their success story. I haven't told a success story, to, but I will in a minute. So you give success stories to Marines. Magicians will figure out their own insight stories. They're good enough to do it themselves. Magicians are like one in 20. One in maybe, you do one in 100. Maybe, maybe magicians are more like one in 100. Wow. But, Real but they, bad closing rate. Generally, they fail a fair bit, but they also do things that no one else can do they start okay. businesses and they open up new territories and they do it where the Marine couldn't do it because they don't have the tools. And then the medic is your, is your account person who, 
who gets to know the client very well and they upsell and it's a different personality. Again, these people are usually very relationship aware and, and they're in it for the long term with their clients, right? And they're upselling to get more users on your software, for example, if it's a software as a service. So these are three distinct personalities and three dist and, and the story for the medic is really the account story. They need to be able to tell their client story and their company story and use those two stories to help build out their account, right? So very distinct types of sales roles. Have I just blown your mind? Wow. I've lost your sound. Yeah, yeah. No, that's incredible. Mind is blown because you could just see the different personas. Correct. Right? The magician, the marine, the medic. They're Correct. all totally different people with totally different skill sets, and different, different job personalities and different jobs and characteristics. Yeah. And, and it's one of my it's one of my biggest complaints about about sales blog articles because they say salespeople have to have this personality. And I'm going, well, what type of salesperson are you talking about? Because the personality is totally different for those things. So you're, you're writing a generic article about sales personality and, and it has to be wrong in most situations because you're not defining what role you're talking about. Right. Wow. So, I love that. I, yeah. It's a really I important insight really actually. See, like the Marines as the guys and gals, uh, thank you for your service for going into the into the battlefield and executing the predictable, repeatable, Correct. scalable revenue game plan. The That's magician it. is the entrepreneur that starts the company, makes takes nothing and makes something of it. And yep. the medic are the customer success and account management team turning these into accounts, these accounts into like whales or recurring revenue with as little churn as possible. I love Correct. that. Correct. Correct. And and big companies have magicians too, Brandon. Big How companies did you come up with this, by the way, like the three M's like, so, so is it, I'd love, because like, oh, I just wanted I'm to, trying to analyze the, uh, I'm, I keep, <laughs> you're making me analyze my cortex. You're making me analyze the psychology. I'm like, man, <laughs> this guy's doing magic on me. Like, am I in war in Norway? Like, and I in 1996, I don't know where I'm at anymore, man. How did you come up with the three M's totally unrelated to sales? I was, I was keen to write about this because I think that so much of what's in the blogosphere on LinkedIn is, is misleading for salespeople because, because it doesn't define context. You know, I understand why people do it. People want to make a noise. They want to make themselves, you know, I'm kind of in that game too. I would like people to hire me, but so much of what we read, I think is, is likely to be counterproductive if you don't understand these basic things about sales. So that's why I wrote about it. And that's why I thought about how to come up with a metaphor uh, to put that a metaphor by the way is like a story on steroids a metaphor is a one-line story because you can wow. vent condense the whole thing down you understand everything yep in one line you know when i say magician it's kind of a metaphor for for business development now and i was going i was going to say that big companies need magicians too big companies have to pivot they need to go into new markets they need to expand geographies and your basic marine new products New, new products, products correct so big companies get that wrong a lot they don't pick the right person for the right role uh, in in uh, in sales so did you have a few thing. options not to get off topic but i'm just curious like when you did the three m's the magician the marine <laughs> were you like well, the turtle the shark <laughs> and the bunny like like did you have a bunch of different options and you're like which three uh, no i was you know i was i started with the concept of magician that's what i thought about first and it started with m so it was more like what else starts with m that would fit and and of course everyone talks about hunters and farmers but the problem is of course hunter hunter encapsulates both magician and marine so it's not Hunter is not descriptive enough. There are two types of hunter and they're very different from each other. Medic, you could say, is like the farmer, if you like. Um, so hunter and farmer is a poor metaphor, in my opinion. I was just about to say, like visualizing both. You don't think of, in my opinion, you don't think of like a hunter and farmer together. Um, I, I don't know. Like, I felt like I visualized your metaphor better yes because you kind of know i don't know for some reason in my head in my cortex that you're messing with right now yeah you I'm know this stuff yeah yes it's easier to like you don't know what a hunter is like it, you got to go way back 
like way, like way back. Well, that's true. Years, we're, we're, we're not, like, we're not hunters right? and farmers. No, you've got to go back 10,000 years before that was kind of a different thing almost. Yeah. Yeah. It, but, but like yeah. the medic, the magician, the Marine, Marine, these are people and like types of personas and roles that you see every day of the week and Correct. they're across society. That's right. And, and they're quite descriptive of personality types. So that's why I like them. Let's move on to success stories or we're going to have a five hour podcast here. Um, that sounds great. So, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about the success story. So most of my stories are four parts. So the first, the first event is a setting in 1996 in Nor I went to Norway. Okay. And then we've got this, what I'll call it a complication event. Something went wrong. You know, I, I, I won, I was so lucky. I won the biggest deal in our company. That's like a surprising thing. How the hell did that happen? Right. And then I resolve it into, and then I became a sales manager or whatever. I might tell that I resolve that and I make a point. So that's really like three or four events, but the yep. success story is six events and it needs to be six events. And I'll explain why. So I'm going to tell you a success story and then we'll break it down. Now, when I, wrote seven stories. I, I had a lady help me at the beginning. She, she had nice, she had a nice metaphor for what she does. She called me her Sherpa, my Sherpa. So she helped me get sort of started and I'd written a bunch of stories and she helped me get the book formalized, how I was going to okay. structure it. And one of her pieces of advice was, was this like an editor or a, a no edit, editing or comes later. This is more at the conceptual stage. How are we going to, okay. you know, so like, you know, we put the fishing metaphor through the book and yep. you know, how do we structure the book and how do we tell the stories in sequence? So she helped me with that. And one of her pieces of advice was do not send your manuscript out everywhere because people will have all sorts of opinion and they'll change a book and it's not a good idea. Okay. And I, I did not follow that advice. Because I wanted to hear from other people who are in sales. I wanted to know what they thought of my ideas. And, and oh, so wow. I sent them and I connected with a guy, you may know him, David Massover. Uh, David's, um, and who's David for the audience, just so everyone's aware. He's David. And uh, he is a, um, he's an ex-Silicon Valley software sales leader. He's been involved with startups. And he wrote two books on sales process. And then he moved to to Budapest for family reasons. And he found that that wasn't the greatest place in the world to be trying to teach sales teams sales process because <laughs> he doesn't know the business culture, the language, anything. So he decided to pivot his business. Yeah, but that's like well, you, that's what you did. <laughs> you went right. to all these regions and yeah, yeah. So David anyway, needs to take a lesson from you. Well, you're going to find out what happened. So he decided that he was going to become a sales coach and just use LinkedIn and connect with salespeople all over the world. And he didn't find that so easy at the start. And about this time, he connected with me and I sent him the manuscript of my book. A week later, he sent me an email and it said, Mike, this is brilliant. He said, I've been in sales for 20 years. I've written two books on sales process and I've never thought about using stories like that. And today I did a combination of my personal story and company story. And the sales guy told me his story exactly like you said he would. And we just started business together and it's amazing. And I'm now changing my sales process to incorporate stories. And I said, good, let's do a video conference and I'll coach you on your personal story. And he, his personal story was pretty good, but it was a little bit long and he had left out a little personal. He'd left out a couple of little bits. So I coached him on it. And here's the thing. He has a full book, right? He has more clients than he knows what to do with. And he's, oh, wow. he's going brilliantly. So That's I amazing. told you that story. It's quite short and it has six parts. And I want to make your listeners appreciate the six parts because it's really important. First thing is I didn't start talking about my company and what I do and how all of that. I talked about David. I told you that he was in Silicon Valley. He was a software startup guy. He'd written books. This is David in his original setting. That's the first event. Now he's got a problem. He's moved country, he's moved, he doesn't understand the business, the language, he has to change his business. So he has a problem. That's the second event. Third event, he meets a guide. That's you. That's your company. Your company is the guide. You're not the hero, you're the guide. The guide, that's the third event. How did he meet the, how did he meet the guide? I emailed him my manuscript. That's how he met me, right? The guide gave him a plan. Now, in this case, the plan was the book, but your company also has a plan for your prospective customers and you're going to provide a plan. 
Then he avoided failure. I actually gave, had a video conference and I coached him on some aspects of his story to get it right so that he didn't fail. And then he succeeded. So avoiding failure is the fifth step. And then success is the sixth step. If you tell your success stories with those six parts, I guarantee that your future client will listen with absolute interest because you're telling a story about someone else like them and you're telling it from their perspective. And that's what case studies don't do. Case studies, marketing case studies are in three parts and they go, this is the, si this is the situation that my client was in and they start with the problem. And they say, here's what we did. And they make themselves the hero. And then they say, here's how wonderful it is. Aren't we great? That three pass case study is terrible. It does not persuade yeah. your client at all. I see it all the time, the before, the after, the results. Before sorry, us, just, after oh, sorry your, your microphone just went crackly again. I wonder why. Uh, you know, I, think you, I think you might have a bad connection possibly. Yeah, you know, I mean, maybe it's... Okay. One second. Or it could be mine also. It could be mine. No. Possibly. I may have... Just pick this up, but maybe it's faulty. Now I do have seven monitors, so... Uh, now, now it's good. It's suddenly now it's good. Okay. Thank you for the heads yeah. up there. That's okay. No, we want good sound. It's really um, important. Oh yeah. So, so I was saying, you know, we see it all the time. The before, the after, the results. Before, yes. After us, the results and how great we are. How great we are. The, the subtext of the case study is, aren't we wonderful? But the subtext of the success story is, isn't my client wonderful? Look how successful they are. And here's the thing, if you tell that the right way, your future client that you're telling this story to, they get to experience that success. That's what stories do. Stories let you experience someone else's world, right? So they experience the other client. They experience what it's like to have your products and services before they even, before they even buy your product, right? This is gold. This is absolutely golden if you can do that. But you need to learn, you need to practice it, and you need to get it in those six parts. Every one of those six parts is important. Tell me about your client before they had a problem. Tell me about the problem. Tell me how they met you, the guide. Tell me about the plan you gave them. Tell me about how they could have failed. Failure is important. The distance from failure to success, how much we can stretch that out, is what makes for the better story. If they almost died and then wow. succeeded, even better. But we've got to have the failure part. We've got to stretch the, diff the distance from failure to success to make a, a compelling success story. And these things work brilliantly. You get a nice success story, you give it to your Marine, and they'll go out and sell all day in that segment, and they'll win. Wow. And, and because I keep trying to visualize this story. So just repeat for the audience, because we're going over a lot of, of different... We are. Um, what, what would you, formulas, what would you call this? You would call this- Yeah, these, these are structures maybe. Structures for how to models, use, right? Yeah, models. Because I'm an engineer, so I like to put things back yeah. to models. So I, when yeah. you're talking about this, I'm thinking of the, uh, the business model, uh, what's that book? Business model generation or there's yeah. a, the boxes and you got to fill well, in you, the boxes. You've got a copy of the book. The book has got diagrams for each of these models. So you can, you can actually visualize- Write them in work. and yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think exactly. you had, don't you have content where you could like download them too? Yes. Yes. You can download the images. And also there's an online training with it has a whole lot of free resources and, awesome. um, and free story. You can actually, you can listen to people's stories. Could I tell about 50 stories and most of them are not my stories. You can listen to those people telling their stories on the online training as well for free. So, wow. Yeah. yeah and guys, like, obviously we're, we're learning on the podcast, how important, storytelling is so i know one of the things that i'm taking away is i have to go online i have to listen to all these stories because i've already learned just in this podcast 10 20 50 different ways that i could tell my story my company's story our successes a hundred times more meaningful impactful uh just to, to move the needle in in how i'm trying to connect and resonate with my audience like we can all learn from like we all of us meet from one, yeah. learn, listening to any of these stories. We could close a, a one, 10, hundred million dollar deal because we told the right story with the right 
model or formulas that connected with that C-suite, that VP, that director to get them to book the appointment, to get them to sign the contract, to get them to do the deal, to see the ROI. Correct. That's right, Brandon. 99% of the LinkedIn messages, the calls, the emails I get are not stories ever. I've never yeah. gotten, I mean, I would, very few, I would say probably maybe 2%. It's all yeah. uh, fact telling. I'd, I'd like to, I know that you have a high proportion of your listeners are uh, at the, sales at the, appo the appointment setting, sales development stage, yep. right? So I'd like, I'd like to say something important about that. Hopefully we still have them along for the ride, Brandon. Um, so you probably can't tell a two or three minute story in a cold call because you interrupted someone and you start some story and they don't want to listen to a story at that point. But you can tell part of a story. So, you, you know, one of the reasons that Netflix is, I'm convinced of this, one of the reasons that Netflix is one of the fastest growing companies is for a very simple thing that they do. At the end of an episode, they go five, four, three, two, one seconds to the next episode. And most people cannot stop themselves going, shit, what's the next episode? <laughs> I've got to listen to the next one, right? We, yeah. binge, we binge read because Netflix has nailed the story of the episode, the next episode, the next episode, the next episode, right? And that's what an SDR can do. Hey, Joe, I'm leaving a voice message. I've just got the results back from our research. You won't believe this. Our guys were looking at company like yours and they investigated this and they thought it was going to be that and it turned out to be something completely different. I want to have a chat with you about it. Now I've told the first half of an insight story and the guy gets the voicemail. Now he may, people don't answer voicemails back, but, but, but he heard your name and he heard something and his brain is going, I wonder how that thing ended just like wow. Netflix, right? Wow. So you're telling half a story. You're telling the first half. I'd like to tell you about someone he lives, he works just down the road from you. He's not in pharmaceuticals, but he's in the chemistry industry. And he had this huge problem. And I wonder if I could tell you what happened there. So you're telling half a story. So you're using half an insight story or half a success story in either your email or your voicemail or your cold call to get the other person wanting to hear the rest of the story. And that's the clue for SDRs that the trick is half a story. Almost no one knows this, Brandon. The good SDRs do it without knowing they're doing it, actually. They're, they're very clever at this. They don't, they don't blurt the whole thing out. It's interesting, isn't it? That's incredible. Yeah, I love that because if, if you hear that story and you feel like you're getting something really interesting that you may care about, but you only got a little bit of it, yeah, um, it's kind of like going out on a, a date. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, like you're going out on a date and um, you're just getting to know someone and then it just ends. You're like, well, I want to go out again. Like, let's, <laughs> yeah. let's take, let's take it a little step further. And, you know, I, right. I don't know, this is an analogy. Like you said, you got to come up with an analogy. Yeah. Uh, that was funny. Yeah. So the, the, the insight story and the success story, and then I'll talk briefly about the last two stories, story six and seven, which is around closing the deal. And, and I wrote these stories with, with big deals in mind because most of my career has been around big deals. But so the two stories are value stories and teaching stories, or you could also call the teaching story, the sales manager's story. So first value stories, when your client, needs to sign any kind of significant deal, I would say even anything above maybe 50 or $100,000, it's, and maybe even less than that, it isn't one person that, that, that makes that decision, it's a committee. And when a committee meets to decide on a deal, you're not there, the salesperson is not there. And you, the people that know the deal well that you've worked with over the course of the deal, maybe we'll call them your sponsor, the people that you've been able to tell your connection stories to, your success stories, your insight stories, those people are quite persuaded. But there are new people in this stakeholder committee that don't really know your company. And they're almost all concerned about risk. What if it goes wrong? 
is this the right thing to spend our money on, right? So we've still got to get the contract signed. And this is a hard thing for salespeople because you lose control at this point. And stories are one of the very few ways that you can keep some kind of control. So let me tell you about the value story. (laughs) The value story is the story that explains to your future client what you're like to deal with how ethical you are and how you behave, usually when things go wrong. So I work for the German multinational company Siemens, and they're a big $100 billion German engineering company. When you buy this, when you buy their stuff, it works. But when I joined them, I was kind of like, how how do these guys sell anything? Because the marketing I thought was awful. And was it all, didn't, all, was all the marketing made by like engineers or? Yeah, it was a hundred slides, hundred slides and it was oh, fact. And, <laughs> yep. and, the, and there wasn't a sales, like we had a sales team, but like there wasn't really sales training and it wasn't like the North American model where you had, you know, month and quarter and commit and all this. It was very casual. And there was, and I'm like, well, there's no sales culture and there's no <laughs> marketing. So why does anyone buy anything? Right. You know, and I'd come from Schlumberger and Schlumberger had pretty good sales and marketing. And, but also an engineering company. And then I started hearing these stories. And, and the one, I, one of the ones I wrote in the book, I, I actually experienced firsthand. I was, I, was with, I was with our CEO. And Siemens is across many industries. And, and, and I was with him for one reason. And he took a call related to a project that was going bad. And what, what had happened, they were, they were delivering um, the electrical transformers for a cable that was going under the ocean from Tasmania, where I grew up, to the, to the mainland Australia, 400 kilometers under the sea. And the ship that was bringing these transformers from Germany to Australia hit a storm in the Southern Ocean, uh, broke its rudder, and the six transformers in this ship were smashed beyond repair. They couldn't, they couldn't be fixed. And so now you've got a piece of public infrastructure, a big electricity cable, and the delivery is looking like it's going to be delayed. It took 18 months to build those things. And, this, and Albert, the wow. CEO, told me, he said, look, the, the Siemens board in Germany they didn't go like, how do we litigate the ship owner and who's going to pay? They just went, how do we build six transformers in record time so that we don't miss the, the project launch, right? And they did. They built six new transformers. They built it in a fraction of the 80-month time, and the project was delivered on time. And that's a value story, right? That is a story about how your company behaves when things go wrong. The, the hospitality industry is full of these kind of stories. You know, the, the, the guests that left their passport on the counter and the bellboy drove out to the airport to give it to them. And, you know, this is how, this is how we are. This is how we behave. Now, they can't be right. fake. They have, to, they have to be true stories. And usually, usually the leaders of the organization model behaviors that create these stories, okay. right? So the yep. Siemens board did oh, yeah, that the of leaders of the company the VPs, did that the VPs, yeah. correct and they model that behavior but the salespeople need to tell those stories and even if that story isn't told in the stakeholder commission in, in the stakeholder meeting imagine this so you've worked for two months on a deal and you've told that story the value story to your sponsor and they go you know this is what happened your sponsor maybe doesn't even say anything they go oh, yeah nice story and then we get into the stakeholder meeting and the cfo says well, what if these guys don't deliver? Now, your sponsor, having heard the story, he's not going to tell the story because he doesn't know the story that well, but he's going to, his tone of voice is going to go, come on, man, it's Siemens. You know, of course they're going to deliver, right? He's convinced because he heard the story, yeah. right? So this is the story yeah, that buying. gets you through to close the deal, right? Wow. These stories are really important in big deals and they're, they're actually important everywhere. The values of your company, how your company behaves after you've sold is critically important to salespeople and you need to collect these stories. And the final story is the teaching story. We might need to teach our sponsor how to get the deal closed. There's an old saying in, in sales management and I don't know where it came from and it says, you need to teach your customer how to buy And you need to teach them how to sell. You teach them how to buy, meaning you need to teach them why they should buy your product and not your competitors. Here's how you should go about buying this thing that you don't know about. It's a teaching job. You need to teach them how to sell because they need to sell on your behalf in that stakeholder meeting. 
So what happens if there's a difficult character in that stakeholder meeting who wants to railroad the meeting and get them doing something else who, or who is just delaying and delaying and, 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 and you can't get the decision. How are you going to teach your sponsor to get through that meeting? Because your sponsor has never bought something like this before, but you have sold that thing many times. So you've collected up stories of how to get around those roadblocks. So you can teach your sponsor. You can only teach them by the way, if you've made a good connection right at the beginning, because normally this is, radio silence tender time and normally you don't normally you're not supposed to be talking to your sponsor during this time but i have never won a big deal where i wasn't because i've always had a tight connection with that person and you always talk with them open secret amongst good salespeople is that you're always talking the whole way through the deal process yeah, um staying close and talking Wow. So I'll tell a quick story about a teaching story. And if we have enough time, you'll include it in the podcast. Yeah, um, no, I, I, we need a quick example of that. Yeah. Because yes. tell me your, uh, per, your ideal prospects, your ideal personas, your, your influencers, your decision makers, your budget holders, how to sell that to the CFO, to the VP of sales. VP critically of important. IT, critically important. Because yeah. you, like, you may not always be able to do that. Like I want to be involved in doing that, but like we pitch it to the VP of sales or the VP of marketing here. And then I have to rely half the time on them selling it to their CFO. I mean, I'm just thinking now like, gosh, maybe I should record a video of the ROI and, mm -hmm. and then they could just, I'll transcribe the video with the ROI and give it to it. Like I'm, you've got my brain thinking like, oh shit, I've got a lot of homework I got to do. That's right. And, but if you think about it, the, your job is not dissimilar to the sales manager's job. You are actually the sales manager for your client. Your client is your sales guy. That's an interesting way to think about it, right? So what you're doing is you're, you, you're going to use the sales manager's story. And I do this all the time. I've been a sales manager for 20 years and I don't tell my sales guys facts. I just tell them stories from a similar situation. Like whatever that happened to me, I did this or I heard about, Paul and he did this right and that teaches them in a story and of course salespeople aren't the great the greatest listeners but they do listen to stories so they learn from those things right so when I was uh, when I was actually um, I was selling I sold a music download system Brandon before there was an iPod in the oh, mid 2000s wow. like a Napster had, yeah, like that, like a Napster before there, and okay. this was to this was to a huge media company, so it was a very big deal, and um, and we had we had that flown in awesome. people to us. Yeah, it was, was great. Like it was ahead of its like world. Yeah, well, well ahead of a time. It was running on two G mobile phone, but it didn't even have three G, right? But oh we could gosh, still stream. We could still stream songs, right? It was what amazing. Are we on now? Are that's we on a five. Now? That's a four G LTE, four G, and we're just bringing out five G. So we're like three, three. You know, so we were doing this on download speeds of between ten and a hundred kilobits per second. Like you couldn't even get a megabit per second. Kilobits. Right? Kilobits, but you could still get, we could still stream a song so we could get a song down, right? Oh my gosh. So, so How I was- did it take to download a song? Like uh, it took, you could, you had to wait about 10 seconds and then it was downloading as the song was playing. So it took about three minutes to download a three minute song, but it was working, right? So you were downloading as it was playing That's not bad. And, and it worked. Not bad. Yeah. Yeah, so that it works. That's yeah. fun. So anyway, um, it's, it was a pretty complicated deal. Technically, it was complicated because we had to get into the customer's mobile network and we had to do all this special equipment. And I had about 10 people from overseas, from Switzerland and different parts of the world in Australia. And we we're working with about 10 or 20 of the clients, technical people. And it was a revenue share. So it was like, a, it was like a, an Apple um, music download. So the revenue share business model. And then we got to the final contract negotiation and we had to go to their headquarters, this big long table and there's like 10 of our guys down one side and 10 down their, guy, their side. And then this new guy turns up, he's the chief negotiator. And this guy is the most domineering, arrogant, angry man who oh. just pulls the contract apart. 99.9% .9 reliability, not good enough. We've got to have 99.999% and we've got to have this, we've got to have that and uh, the price and the revenue, yeah. sh revenue share is not going to be 10 cents a song. It's going to be one cent. And, and I'm coming out, I came out of this first meeting and I'm like, we're not going to close this deal. It's impossible. And I, I got back You're in the office. Dead. And, 
one of the um, one of the experienced sales guys, one of the more experienced sales guys, looked at me and said, "What's wrong?" And I told him, and he said, "Well, why don't you just ring the guy up and go and have a chat?" I hadn't even thought of it, Brandon. I had not even considered the possibility. This guy was so domineering, right? He was yeah, negotiator's negotiator. But I did. I rang him up, and I spent two hours, and I realized that he didn't have a clue what he was negotiating about. And, um, and I explained to him how it was working, explained the revenue share. We got back in the next meeting and he was the exact same character, right? He did not change his role one bit, but he skirted around all the non-negotiable issues, right? Without saying anything about our discussion, right? And we closed the deal. Wow. And that's a teaching story, right? How do I get around a difficult character? When you've got to make sure they don't lose face, you've got to get them on their own and you've got to explain how things work, right? So we've got to teach our sponsor how to get around these problems. And we do it with the sales manager story because sales managers are good at that. Wow, that's incredible. So to recap, let's, let's recap. Yeah, let's recap the seven there's, stories. There's seven stories. I'm going to try this. You coach me. I'm going okay. to try this. So there's seven stories. The story types are hook stories. These are stories to connect. You've got one, your personal story. Two, yep. your key staff story. Yep. Three, your company creation story. These are hook stories, stories to connect. The next set are fight stories, stories to differentiate, insight stories, and success stories. And then the last two stories seven, uh, six, no, seven stories, six right? Seven. Land stories, stories to close the deal, value stories and teaching stories. And it sounds like the sales secret, world's best sales experts share their secrets to sales success. Mike Adams secret is to sell is to tell stories in sales. And, uh, wow, man. The best salespeople. How do the best salespeople connect, influence, and pers persuade with stories? And they all do it even if they don't know they're doing it, Brand. And here's the thing. I have never come across a successful company founder or top salesperson that wasn't telling stories all the time. Now, they may not notice it, but they're doing it. They all do it. This is incredible. I, I am now motivated, energized, jacked up, excited to go on your, your website, the course, download all the material, start filling it in. I want to Good. listen to 50 stories. Where can people uh, find the course, find the information? Yeah, the, seven the easiest way is just type in seven stories every salesperson must tell into Google and you'll find it on all the bookstores, Amazon. It's still on, the ebook is still on sale at $2.99. I'm just going to keep it there for a year or so. At the moment, I just want people to get the book. The audio book will come out in about two weeks' time. And I have Mike Bosworth telling his forward in the audio book himself. And I have people who are in the story telling their stories themselves. So we had some fun with the audio book. And um, yeah, and the online course is called, is that uh, you'll find that from my7stories.com. My7stories.com. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Guys. Thank you so much, Mike Adams, with seven stories every salesperson should tell. Seven stories takes you on a high stakes sales journey using stories to establish rapport and trust, deliver insight, inspire action, and close the deal. And in doing so, you're going to win new friends and collaborators for life. And when you share purposeful stories in your client conversations, you're going to create more new business than you ever thought possible. Mike Adams. Thank you so much, man. I learned a ton. I'm really excited for our sales, marketing, and entrepreneurship audience to learn as much as possible from you. And uh, we truly appreciate you, man. Thank you so much for joining. Wonderful. Uh, it was great. We had a really good discussion. I appreciate it, Brandon. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Sales Secrets from the Top 1%. We release new episodes every Monday and Thursday, so make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube to never miss an episode.